Hello and welcome. This is Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining me today. Spellbinders was kind enough to send me some house mouse stamps to play with and create with. So today I'm using these two party stamps to create some shaker cards. I loved how they had a party birthday theme and thought they would be really fun in bright, bold colors. I haven't pulled my Copic markers out for a while, so I thought I would use them to color with. So I'm stamping with some black Memento ink. This is a nice Copic friendly ink and I'm using my Misty stamping tool in order to do that. These stamps have a lot of detail to them. So I wanna make sure to stamp them twice to make sure I get all of that detail. And by using the Misty that helps me do that, I know that I'm gonna stamp in exactly the same spot. I'm gonna do both of these stamps at the same time. I'm going to stamp them and then color them at the same time. Might as well do that two at once when I have everything out and ready to go. So I'm doing the second one as well with the Memento ink. I'm using black, but I think these would be really nice as well if you use like a dark brown ink or whatever color you like really. I'm using Hammer Mill cardstock to stamp and color on. I like using the Hammer Mill with my Copic markers. It's a nice smooth cardstock, so they glide on really, really nicely. So the first color I'm doing is I'm gonna use it for the dark mouse. I'm using E33, E47, and E49. And if you've never used Copic or alcohol markers before, typically you use anywhere between two and sometimes some people use five different shades of a single color in order to do your shading. I typically will do three. It's a great um, idea to start with two if you're new to it and then work your way up till you find your comfort zone. And I always go light, medium, dark, and then back to the medium and back to the light. By doing this, you can really get some nice blending in. And the thing I love about using alcohol-based markers is the paper is always very forgiving. You don't have the paper start to pill like it does with dye-based markers. So if after your first go around, you don't necessarily love the blending or you think it should be darker in a certain area, you can go back and redo it. And you can also lighten by using the blender pen. I don't do it in this video at all, but if there's an area that ends up being a bit too dark, you can always take the Copic blender pen and lighten it up and then redo your blending. I will typically wait and let the ink dry between doing different coats because I find that as the ink dries, it blends even more. So for the nose, hands and feet, I'm using ROO and R22. It's a nice pink color. It's got a bit of a peachy pink to it. And I'm doing that as well in the ears. Because those areas are so, so small, I decided to only use two colors. If you wanted to use three or even more, you absolutely could. But I find in the smaller areas, there's so little area for detail, there's not really much point in doing too many colors. So for the gray brown mice, I'm using W3, W5, and W7. It's a nice neutral gray that's got a bit of a brown tone to it. Um, and I'm doing the same method going from light, medium, dark, and then back through the medium and back to the light. And I try to kind of make an idea of where the sun might be, the light source might be, usually above them. And I choose areas that are farthest away from that to be the darkest. Now, when you're working with round figures or mice, you also want to have a little bit of shade, shading around the curved areas. So you're not gonna only do the shading on the bottom, you're gonna do a little bit on the outside as well, but the darkest part is towards the bottom. The nice thing about these stamps, especially when it comes to the feet and tail, as well as the party things, is these stamps have nice little dots in them and it really gives you a good indication of where the shading is gonna go. So it takes a little bit of the guesswork, especially if you're new to working with alcohol ink markers and putting some of those details in. It really helps to you to decide exactly where some of that shading should go. And it makes it a little bit easier. So I'm using the same colors at, for the nose, hands, feet, and ears as I did for the brown mouse. So it's ROO and R22. And once again, doing the light color, then doing the shading with the dark, and then going back with the light. And there is some times where I realize I missed a hand or I missed a, an area shading, and I easily go back and do that. I love that about alcohol ink markers is that it's not a one time and you're done. You can go back and you can touch up and you can add more detail or add more shading. What you probably didn't notice because the camera's a little bit far away, when I did that first brown mouse, I did a little bit too much of the brown and I 
lost one of his fingers on his fur. But the cool thing about alcohol markers, I'm assuming all alcohol markers, I've only worked with Copic markers. They're my favorite and I haven't really had a reason to change um, brands is when you go back, even with the lighter colors on the dark, you're kind of pushing the ink away. So I was able to get that finger back just by going with the ROO, coloring it, letting it dry, coloring it, letting it dry. And I got the finger back. But like I said, you probably don't even see it in this video because it's a little bit far back and that's such a small detail. You'll also notice I'm working on some scrap paper and that's so that if this ink goes through the cardstock, I'm not going to stain my media mat with it. It's going to only go into the scrap piece of cardstock so or paper. So it's a really good idea to be working with some scrap paper underneath. I always keep some extra sheets from the printer. You know, when you print something off or online, you always get that extra sheet that you really don't need. I keep those, put them in a drawer, and that's what I use them for. So for the pinks, for his hat, as well as the little... Um, birthday blower I can't remember what those are called I'm using RV13 RV06 and RV29 typically the general rule when you're using Copics is to use two to three numbers off from each other so when I was using E43 E47 E49 that's two numbers off all within the same color family for these pinks they're not within so I've got 13 06 and 29 but I still have a light medium and dark so I'm still doing the same um, coloring it with the light going in with the medium then going in with the dark and then back with the medium and back with the light some of my markers I found while I was coloring were actually needing to be refilled so I would put them aside so some of the colors don't um, necessarily go within the same uh, color family but they work together anyways. So you'll often find there's different colors that work well. So for the yellows here, I'm only doing two shades of yellow because the areas that I'm putting them in are small. So I've got Y02 and Y08. For really tiny areas, you don't need any more than that. There's not a whole lot of shading to it. I had another color in there, but I found it was very close to one of um, the other ones that I was using. So there was just no point. I totally missed while I was filming this at the bottom of that bottom one is off camera. All there is on there is a little bit of confetti on the ground as well as the shadow on the ground. So you'll see it in the further cards or the when I start working on the rest of the card, but um, it's off screen for this. So for the blues, I'm using BG01, 05 and 09. Everything that I'm using will be listed and linked down in the description box below. So if there's something that I happen to miss, I'm trying not to, but if I happen to miss something, you'll find the information likely down below. Otherwise, just put a comment and I will fill you in. So once again, for the blue, I'm doing medium or starting with the light, going in with the medium and then going in with the dark. I'm doing it for the ribbons here. I absolutely love the ribbons. So anywhere an, a ribbon goes behind another, there would be a shadow. This also has a little bit of the dots to it, so you'd be able to see where some of the other shadows go. I'm trying to make the ribbons that are behind others or further in the distance a little bit darker, just to get a little bit of light areas and dark areas. And this ribbon part, if you're new to shading and stuff like that, is a great place to practice because there's a lot of little areas where the ribbon twists. There would be a shadow there. Where one goes behind another, there would be a shadow there. You can also use often for um, figuring out where to shade things, often on stamp packages, and this one's no exception, it'll have the image colored and you get an idea of where some shadows or where things were intended. Now for this one, the ribbon is um, multicolored, so it looks really cool as well. I was not about to try to mimic that. I thought one color would be great. And I really loved this uh, kind of tealy blue color and thought it would be kind of a cool thing for the streamers. So you'll see me as I go back, I'll keep touching things up because I'll realize that I missed an area and have to go back in. Once again, the coloring isn't perfect, but you actually can't see it when you're not looking super close. And even if someone is looking close, chances are they wouldn't notice it really either. If by chance you go outside the lines, you can use the colorless blender to help fix it. And what you would do is you would color it 
color that area with the colorless blender, let it completely dry. And if it's not completely gone, you can go back over it again. But you do want to make sure that you, to let it dry in between those fixings. I find lighter colors are much easier to fix than darker colors, like a dark navy or a dark red or burgundy. You'll get a tiny little bit of pigment that just kind of stains the paper and you can't fix it. But often it'll lighten up enough that it's not necessarily noticeable. And really, when we're doing these images and coloring these images, we're working so close to them that we see all the uh, mistakes. Most people wouldn't even notice it, but because we're so close to it, we tend to notice it. And also when you are coloring and blending, you'll also find that as the color dries, as the ink dries, it continues to blend. So for the shadow underneath, I am using C1 and C3. And I'll often do this with Copic markers. I'll use my C1. It is a gray, but it's barely noticeable. I'll do just a little bit of a line all the way around. And it's enough that it just kind of pops the image off of the background. But it's something that until you point it out to someone, they don't even know that it's there. So it's a nice subtle way to get your image to just kind of pop off the surface. And then the C3, I'm just using it for the shadow on the ground, just to put a little bit of a darker area and then blending out, blending it out with the C1. And once again, this stamp has little dots to show you exactly where that shadow goes. So there's very little left to the imagination. You don't really have to figure it out yourself. You can just use those dots as a guideline. So it's a great way to start working this, working with alcohol markers or working with shadows and light um, by using these images here. I'm using these with Copic markers. You could easily watercolor them, or if you prefer to use dye base markers, you absolutely can color them that way. I had just thought they would be really, really nicely done with Copic markers, and I hadn't pulled mine out in a while. It's one of my favorite ways to color because I love the end result, um, but it does take a little bit longer than, say, just watercoloring an image. So I'm using some glossy accents. Once my image is completely covered, I'm using the glossy accents on the eyes, and then I put some stickles on the hat for some sparkle. After I let that dry, I thought that hat should also be shiny, so I put some glossy accents on top of that. And then those streamers, I thought it just would look nice with a little hint of sparkle. So I only put a little tiny outline on there. I didn't completely fill them in with glitter, but just enough to catch the light. And then I also did it on the uh, party noisemaker. I can't remember what those are called. Again, just for a little bit of sparkle, it just catches the light. Um, but it's not in your face. Because these are going to be shaker cards, there's going to be a lot going on in the shakers anyways. There's going to be the extra stuff. But I always think some of these extra touches just make an image pop a little bit. When you're using glossy accents, make sure to tap your bottle on your surface before you are done using it and um, lightly press the bottle so that you can make sure that that nozzle is clear for the next time you want to use it. I have the floating balloons 3D embossing folder here that I thought would look great with that those party images. So I'm using the um, Spellbinders Platinum 6 machine to emboss it and using their stacking that they have listed right on their plates. After that is done, and I like to mist those with water. Anytime I'm doing 3D embossing, I like to mist it with water and then let it completely dry. Once that's dry, I'm cutting this down. I'm going to make my card five and a half by five and a half. So these balloons are five and a quarter by five and a quarter. I want there to be a little bit of um, a border around them. Now I wanted these balloons to have a bit of color, but I didn't want that color to compete with the colors in my images. So I chose to use some solar paste and some detailed ink blending brushes and paint that color on there. So I'm using Cross My Heart, Royal Flush, Beluga, crocodile tears and I'm just doing one color at a time completely cleaning my brush out and then I'm going on with the next color. At first I had four different brushes out but I realized that as I was working the um, paste was starting to dry so I would clean my brush in between and I absolutely love the hint of color it gives that background. I think it turned out so pretty. So I chose to do a bright color for my background for the mat. I have my card bases underneath there. They're five and a half by five and a half. And I wanted to have that color framing this balloon part. And I'm also using that same color to create a frame for the front of the shaker card element. 
I'm using Barely Art glue to glue it down, and I'm putting an acrylic block on top of there to hold it down nice and flat while that glue dries. I always like to put an acrylic block on there just because it frees up my hands to work on other things and um, it holds everything nice and flat and especially when you're using a 3d embossing folder there's so much detail and dimension in there that you don't want some of that to flip up or raise up while you're letting it dry if you're working on other things so for the first card here i have my frame already cut i use some dies off screen to just die cut that for the second one i will show you how to do that with a um, a slide blade trimmer so you can create your own frame with it if you don't happen to have dies that will work and I have a piece of acetate here that I'm just putting in that window I use some nice strong tape in order to hold that into place and then I'm taking some nice thin foam strips and putting that in the middle of the back of my frame and I want to make sure to go all the way around it doesn't have to be right on the inside of the frame or right on the outside of the frame. It can be wherever you want. And I'm just doing mine in the center. I'm actually going to do a double layer of this foam tape. I want there to be enough room for my shaker bits to be able to move around. So after I do my first layer, I'm going to take my backing off and then I will do a second layer on top of it. And when I do that, I typically make sure that my join parts or my join pieces are not in the same place for the second layer so that it just is a little bit more strong. The one thing you want to make sure, especially if you're making a shaking, shaker card, is that there are no open areas. If you have any open areas, some of your shaker bits are going to fall out of there. So you want to make sure that it is completely closed. And one step here that I totally missed the inside of this foam tape is a little tiny bit sticky on the areas that don't perfectly um, line up with the layer below it or above it. So something that you can do is take an embossing powder tool and just brush it on the inside before taking that backing off and before putting your shaker bits in there. And that is going to cover up that sticky area so that none of your shaker bits um, stick to that. I found after I, because I didn't do that, once my card was together, when I went to shake it, some of my shaker bits would stick to those areas. It doesn't look bad, but it just uses up some of those shaker things. Now, I didn't put a ton in my card because I didn't want to cover up that image. I thought those images were adorable and I didn't want to chance um, putting too many, too much in and have it cover up any of that image. But you can add more if you want. If you like a lot of shaker bits in there, you can do that. I like to collect these as I go along. So I just had a bunch of different star confetti, some colors that matched some of the colors that I had used in the coloring. Now here's the second card here and I'm doing a quarter inch border around. So I've already got my piece cut for how big I want it. I'm lining the edge of that paper up with the quarter inch mark and then I'm starting my blade a quarter inch down and then stopping it a quarter inch from the edge of that uh, cardstock. Now I'm going to do this all the way around so that I have a quarter inch border all the way around. Typically, I would do it a little bit wider than a quarter inch, especially if this is your first shaker card. I'd probably do about a half an inch. I didn't want to cover up too much of these images. And because these images are fairly long, I wanted to um, not have, have my card too big. What I would do is I would start, if you were new to shaker card making, I would start by making a frame like this that has, say, a half an inch border just gives you a little bit more room to work with. When it's smaller, there's just an easier chance of it warping as you're um, putting your thing together. And a wider area would give you a little bit more stability. So after I put that strong double-sided tape on there, I took the backing off and then put that acetate right on there, trimmed off any excess bits. My acetate was a little bit smaller than the cardstock, but it's hard to get it down exactly perfect, and it's really easy to trim excess off. No one ever knows that you did that. I'm going to put that same foam tape that I used on the first card. I'm doing a double layer again, and you may have noticed on the first one, and I'm doing it again on the second one, I'm using my Misty stamping tool, putting that frame in the corner, and then putting my image piece on top of it. That way I can get perfect alignment without worrying about um, trying to do it well the first time. It makes it so much easier. 
So there's my shaker element for the second card here, and I can glue it right to the front of the card. Now I made these cards bigger so that you could see the balloon 3D embossed because I thought it blended really nicely with the images from these cards. But you could do it where you did a shaker card where the entire front of a card was the shaker element. You don't necessarily have to do a 3D embossing folder or a background behind it. That's the great thing with card making is we can pick and choose what we want to do and what we want to leave out. So I just have my Versamark ink that I've stamped my image with. I'm embossing it with white embossing powder and using a heat tool to do that. For my second sentiment, I'm actually only going to emboss the word birthday. So I'm using the whole stamp, but I'm only using that Versamark ink on the word birthday. And then I'm going to use the happy die from the Spellbinders Christmas die and Glimmer Sentiments and die cut that out of some scrap cardstock and glue that with that. I just like the look of the two scripts together and thought it would be something a little bit different. One thing to remember is if you get any embossing powder on an area you don't want it to, make sure you use a soft brush and brush it off before embossing it. Once you've embossed your image, it's too late. You can't take it off, but it's easy to take a small brush and brush it off ahead of time. I'm using my embossing tool to emboss that, and I die cut that script off um, off screen, but this is a great set for holiday cards. I love the fact that they have one of the words as a die cut and one of the words or two of the words as a glimmer sentiment. It just gives you a little bit more options. Um, and I just like the two of them together. It just looks really cool. So this was just a different way of using that set, but not on holiday cards is just by using the word happy. I'm going to take those pieces and I'm going to glue them into the center of the card. Now I used the center part of my shaker bit. If this looks weird to you and it kind of does a little bit, you could easily use a larger piece and then emboss that script on there. You could emboss that script right on the inside of the card, or you could um, mimic the front of the card and have a large mat with that color and then white on the inside and emboss on that. Now the front of the card, just those shaker bits, I thought looked a little bit plain. So I took this bow die from the Christmas uh, bundle from Parcel and Post die set and I just die cut it with some glitter cardstock. It just added a little bit of sparkle and broke up that rectangle shape. Another way you could do this is you could have put the sentiment on the front of the card. But again, I didn't want to um, cover up much of that image. I thought those images were adorable and I wanted to be able to see as much of them as possible. So these are the finished cards. I hope you enjoyed following along for the journey. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you being here.